Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Parsons. Karen, good morning. Welcome to the show. Hi. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. <laughs> How are you doing? We are very good over this side of the planet. You are in a little wee town in Massachusetts yeah, at the moment. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah, probably just for a little while. Hopefully back to Brooklyn soon. But we'll see what, how things go. Well, look, play things by ear, I think is a good way to go. We're in another state of pretty hardcore lockdown in, in Melbourne, in Victoria and Australia here. So we're just going to make the most of the opportunities that that provides. And I'd like to start off asking you something a little bit left of centre. You're more famously uh, known as an actress in the show, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, known as Hilary Banks. On the show, I understand that James Avery, the, the chap who played Dr. Phil, or not Dr. Phil, okay. Uncle Phil, don't get those two confused, <laughs> used to play a lot of jazz music really loudly. Is yeah. that where you got your love of Ella Fitzgerald from? Oh, <laughs> No, I actually knew about Ella Fitzgerald before that, but um, definitely got to hear some Ella uh, coming out of James's room. Um, James, yeah, James was just, he loved his jazz and he blasted it. And most of our rooms, our doors were wide open to our room. So he was pouring down the halls and, and uh, he had no intention of turning it down. <laughs> Nobody wanted him to, but if anyone had, it was great, but I had, I already, was, I was familiar with Ella for a long time. Well, I was just curious to know, cause you, you're an author and you wrote a, a, a beautiful book, How High Is The Moon? And I was curious if there was a link between Ella Fitzgerald's song and your yeah. book title. Well, yeah, um, How High The Moon is a, a, a song that Ella Fitzgerald made famous, yes. And in the book, it's the story of a little girl named Ella, who, um, who it, she's uh, living in the Jim Crow era South in, in 1944 in the segregated South, a little town outside of South Carolina. Her mother, she lives with her grandparents and her cousins, and her mother is up in Boston trying to be a jazz singer. So the song has some play within the, the book in, in, in those regards but also it just meant a lot to me in terms of kind of reaching for something, trying to reach for something that seems like it's out of reach. Did your gift of writing flow naturally or was it really hard work? Oh, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. Sorry. It was hard. It is hard. Um, no, I've never, I've never felt like, I mean, I've had moments. I've had moments where I wrote and it just seemed, and I think those are the, the moments that get you high and, and you're chasing that, forever chasing that dragon of trying to get, you know, then that's that, that role again, when things just kind of just come and characters are just speaking to you and you're writing it down and you read it later and you go, wow, where'd that come from? That was great. That was a good feeling, you know, but a lot of the time it is like, taking you know crooked chipped off pieces of brick and trying to lay one over the other and make them match and that doesn't fit and maybe it'll fit if i put this maybe you know it's a lot of that i feel like I'll, there are so many days that are just clumsy and messy and um discouraging but um i've come to just make myself a try to just show up and do the clumsy carpentry and building and then come back later and hopefully when I go over it later I can go oh I can smooth this with this or here's a better piece and you know I can try to I have faith that that will happen that and, and you know in How High the Moon I had many 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 struggles of that sort throughout and ultimately I keep reminding myself that in the end I ended up with a book that um, while it's not perfect I still can say, oh, this is whole, and I did it, even though at times it felt like there was no way that was going to happen. So um, that keeps me going too. <laughs> well, congratulations on, on getting it done. Uh, I mentioned off air that I've just, just finished my very first draft, and 
And I totally empathize with the challenges associated. And mine was written about my own life. I'm curious oh, to I'm curious to know what are some what's some advice that you can give any aspiring writer? Um well, I mean the, the advice that I, I keep, I'm always still to this day looking to writers that are doing it and have been doing it for any kernels of, of knowledge and wisdom that can help get me through. And um, one thing I do hear a lot is that you just, have, you just have to show up. You just have to show up. And that's the most important thing. And so, so actually I have a, a quote up on my wall over there. It says, it's from Octavia Butler, who's a, who was a science fiction writer who I really, really love, loved. Um, and it, she says, first forget inspiration. Habit is more dependable. Habit will sustain you whether you're inspired or not. Habit will help you finish and polish your stories. Inspiration won't. Habit is persistence in practice. <laughs> and I have that up over my desk along with some other things. So you remind me, it's like, just get here. Whatever today brings, if it's tinkering, if it's chipping away, if it's writing, if it's free writing, whatever I can do. And I think for a lot of people to not get discouraged um, she's here. Can I read another quote of hers? Cause she's great. She says, yeah, yeah. You don't start out writing good stuff. You start out writing crap and thinking it's good. And then gradually, gradually you get better at it. That's why I say one of the valuable traits is persistence. And so that's also there <laughs> to remind me that, you know, it's not, and if this is a difficult one, my husband's uh, grandfather was an illustrator, a very just beautiful, wonderful Russian illustrator. Russian, yeah. And, yeah, and he. Privet. Uh, sorry. Privet. Oh, I, I don't speak Russian. <laughs> just it means hello. There you go. But it's really he did an amazing work, and he was very tough and critical of what, uh, and he worked very diff, uh, very hard with my um, husband when he was a boy on his work and his drawings. He was very tough but really, he really cared. And one of the things he would say to him is, there is nothing as perfect as a white, a clean white piece of paper. Like you're not gonna, and basically the idea is anything you do is gonna be, is gonna mess that up. And I think if you can get past trying to make something perfect and just give yourself permis permission to write crap. That's my thing is I have to give myself permission to suck. I'm like, just, just suck. Just be terrible. Just be awful. Just whatever it is, just put it down. Cause then you can go back to it tomorrow and you read it and go, Ooh, I could do better than that. But you get the gist of where you're going and the head you're in the next time might, you know, and the body you're in <laughs> might help you to say what you're trying to say better. And you can keep, you know, Another thing people say all the time, and I would give this advice, is that really writing is rewriting. And if you just remind yourself that that right, put first putting it down, don't worry about that because that's not really the writing. It's going to be in the rewriting anyway. Um, those are things I have to do because with my, when I read my first drafts of things, I'm just mortified. I want to go hide under something. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. And trying to show somebody the first thing I've written is just the worst. That's the hardest thing is when you when you have to first show the very first person something, you know, and lucky for me, I have my husband, I have a good friend who I trust. I had my mother um, until recently who, who I also, those are the people that I would go here because they were, you know, I could, I could handle what they could come back with before it went out past that. So I think that's helpful too. If you have somebody you can go to, you take those baby steps of pushing it out because they also might see things that you can quickly work with and tidy up before it goes to, you know, your editor or a publisher or a submission or something. Yeah, I love that, Karen. And, and uh, I'm very blessed. I've got a, a very benevolent fiance who's been on the receiving end of, hey, honey, can you come listen to this for me? Yeah. And, um, and she's been really complimentary and some of the other people I've seen it too have been really complimentary too. So hopefully they're not placating me and it's actually pretty half decent. So it's inspired me to, to keep writing. And, and I suppose what else uh, writing wise have you got on the cards, if anything? Well, I'm working right now. Um, I am working right now on my, on another book. It's not related to the first 
to the first one. It is historical fiction as well, but it takes place in a different place and time. I don't like to say too much about it because I find myself going through and going, maybe I'm going to change it. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, why don't you why don't you tell us about Henry Box Brown? Because I think this is a brilliant story, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, this is um, this was the first the first in a series of stories uh, for my organization, Sweet Blackberry. Um, the first story that we did. And these are these are um, uh, little known stories of African American achievement, geared toward young kids, and they are animated films, short animated films. I'm happy to say that starting in December of this year, we're going to release our first picture book. Of Congratulations. Time. Thank you. That was the intention all along. My mother worked um, in the library system my whole life when she was a, a librarian hitting the Black Resource Center at her library when she called me. I was an adult at this point, and she called me and she told me the story of Henry Box Brown, an enslaved man who literally mailed himself to freedom in a box. <laughs> And that was crazy to me that this, this is a true story that a man had actually had a box built, had climbed inside, had it nailed shut and sent from Virginia to Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And when he survived that 27 hour journey and they opened the box up, he was a free man because he was across state lines where there was no slavery. And um, I was just floored by this story as my mom was, which is why she was sharing it. But then I ended up being kind of equally as kind of bowled over by the fact that I had never heard it and none of my friends had heard it. And I thought, this is crazy. This is a real story. Like, why don't we know this story? And I thought it'd be such a perfect book for kids, you know, about this man, the mystery and the secret, and then the triumph. And, um, and so much to teach kids about perseverance and, and what you're capable of when you really, when you have an obstacle and, you're determined to, to get over it, past it, through it, under it, whatever, to get over on the other side of it. And uh, so I was really, I was really excited about making a, a book of that, of Henry's story. And uh, I talked about it a lot and then I, and I'd make notes on it. And then I would go for years, months, I guess, and forget about it and then come back to it and make more notes and then go and forget about it. And then I'd find other stories and my mom would share other stories and those, and I'd say, oh, I'm going to do a whole series of books. And, and then I'd forget about it. And this went on for years until I was um, pregnant with my first child, which will make you think things through a little bit differently. Suddenly it was personal. I started thinking, you know, I was talking about, you know, what do they teach her in the schools? And how do we supplement her education and make sure she's learning the things we want? My, you know, my, my mom learned a lot more about Black history growing up in the segregated South than I did in integrated schools in the 1970s and 80s. Wow. So, um, you know, I didn't know, you know, I just, I didn't know what I was, what I needed to do for her. I started talking about Henry Box Brown and these stories. And my husband was like, you need to stop talking about this. You need to just do this. So I had no idea how. So I started investigating, talking to people. Self-publishing wasn't what it is today. It was, complete mystery didn't know how to do something like that so I figured I could make a little film and I started to talk to people about how I could do that and I ended up um, meeting illustrators and animators and putting together I had to write it sit down and write this story about um, Henry Box Brown and we ended up with our inaugural of Sweet Blackberry story the journey of Henry Box Brown narrated by Alfred Woodard and very it was, it was a great experience Wow, and and uh, again, congratulations because it's a, a it's a great story that has to be shared. And I was even just thinking in my head because your your husband uh, is a director, I believe, and um, maybe maybe some short films all combined together with some of the more of these other stories uh, could be done. Be like it is. a be great. yeah, Karen. Uh, I grew up in New Zealand, and the time that the show was on. Mm -hmm. was a really tumultuous time in my own youth. Um, there was a lot of dysfunction going on at home. And, and, and I just want to say thank you for being involved with something that provided such a ray of light, not only to me, but to a lot of people that I know growing up. 
um, the values and the, the, the spirit of the show was half an hour of just escapism, I suppose, to take me away at times from a lot of the, the dysfunction happening in my life. So for that, I'm very, very grateful. And, and I suppose my question is, what was your own childhood growing up like? Uh, well, it depends on what part, I guess. I mean, it was mostly, I will say for the most part, it was, um, it was good. It was good. I mean, I didn't have, I'm, I'm happy to say as unconventional as my childhood was and as kind of, I know to a lot of people look at it sometimes from the outside and they, they project a lot of, um, I don't know, sadness onto some parts of it or, or potential dark things onto it. Um, it wasn't for me. I grew up in the 1970s in uh, Santa Monica, California. And it wasn't very, I mean, it was very hippie time. You know, it was kind of, my parents weren't hippies, but it was Santa Monica beach community in the 70s. And I was this big afro um, little girl. Uh, this was when I was much smaller. As I got older, I ended up, you know, going through my different hair looks but uh, as a teenager. But, you know, I, I had the big afro and I would be one of maybe two um, black kids in my class. I didn't know anyone mixed when I was little. Uh, when I got older, I knew in high school, I think I knew three mixed people. And, wow. You know, in junior high, actually, Lenny Kravitz was in my junior high. and I Really? Told, yeah, he was older than me and I had a huge crush on him. <laughs> well, I had a huge crush on him. <laughs> Who doesn't have a huge crush on Lenny, right? <laughs> oh, you um, go my way. <laughs> all right. And then years later, I actually, we became friends. But um, when we weren't in school together, strangely enough, but we became friends later. But I didn't have, um, you know, I didn't see people that were biracial or mixed. And, and I didn't have, there weren't a lot of black kids in the school or very, very few. So I grew up, but I grew up feeling like I understood the, how things were. Um, I think there are definitely quiet, private, even un unbeknownst to yourself, sufferings that you go through when, um, you know, in, in this country, in certain countries, when you're kind of uh, not treated equally and fairly. And, and, but you, it feels like things are okay in your life. I mean, my, my father was white, my mom was black, and that was just who we were. And I didn't, I very, very rarely experienced very in-your-face racism. You know, I mean, I've, I've been called the N-word when I was little. I was I've, more than once when I was older as well. It's happened a few times, I guess. But I didn't, um, when I was little, it was shock. It was a little shocking because no one had done anything like that. And it was unfamiliar to me. I remember I was also called a zebra once. My mom says I came home. I mean, I didn't remember the, the zebra one. I remember the other one, but my mom said I was called a zebra and I came home crying because this guy called me a zebra. And I was so upset that he would call me an animal. Why would he call me an animal? She said, that's what I was upset Zebras about. are beautiful animals. <laughs> I know, but it is, that I was called an animal was that, you know, as a child, of course you understand that something derogatory is being slung at you, regardless yeah. of what it's called. It could be called, you know, purple peacock. And you're like, why did you say that to me? <laughs> that has enough venom and nastiness on it. You know that that's bad and, and that someone's saying something bad about you. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, I didn't, but I didn't, like I say, I, I grew up with, I had good friends for the most part. I had my share of mean people and um, having to be punished because I got a, a good report card. So I was punished by, you know, by not getting candy when everyone else got candy, but the teacher had singled me out. And so I got, I felt it and I learned early on, oh, you don't do that. <laughs> Blessing in disguise, not getting candy back then. <laughs> and then not getting candy and getting good grades. But the message that a kid takes is like, oh, yeah. you want everyone to know you're doing well in school. So back off of that, you know, because um, you want the candy. But um, this is unfortunate. But yeah, I, you know, I had very, I, 
my mother and I were very, very close and she was always incredibly supportive. And I wanted to act since I was like six years old. And I was declaring, you know, I'm gonna be an actress, I'm gonna be an actress. And of course, everyone thought it was a phase. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You know, every year that went by, I was still declaring the same thing and having to see every movie Jodie Foster was in, and because <laughs> she was a child actor, you know, actress. And um, and then I started taking classes and workshops, and that made me get more serious about it. And then you know, eventually, I was it was, I was older when I started getting work, but I ended up you know I was getting some work, and so I was. I was taken more seriously, but all along I was given support. All along, when I did dance recitals when I was really little, my mom came to everything. She helped sew costumes and she was never a stage mom, but she, and we didn't have a lot of money, but she managed to get money for my acting workshops and take me, drive me to them. And like I said, when I did recitals, she was always there. And then when I was older and I was on Fresh Prince, she was there at almost every single show for six years, except wow. for maybe. A handful over six years she was there every Friday night um, huge support and that went that went so far for me like I said we I never felt like we were poor I mean standards were different then so that the standards we lived by we weren't hungry and I had clothes and you know so nobody thought of our living arrangements or anything is or what, what we didn't have as a measurement of how we were you know but yeah. things changed Things changed, I guess, in the 80s and 90s. Things changed, and suddenly, if you don't have these things, that means that you're um, not, you know, you're not doing well or something. I don't know. And people became very concerned with those things. But when I grew up, fortunately for me, we didn't care about stuff like that, and so I never thought of myself as lacking uh, at all. And like I said, I had a lot of love and support, and that was unwavering, and I didn't question it. And, um, you know, and I didn't have siblings. Uh, so I was, I was very clingy to my friends. <laughs> you know, wanting people to stay over. What do I, you want to have this? You want this? You want this? You can have all these things because I want you to stay, you know. Um, but, uh, but it was good. It was, you know, there was, I, I really, I, it's funny because people are always trying to pick apart things there were strange behaviors with, with my, my dad's an odd guy, um, very odd person, but he, he means well, he's always meant well. And I understood that. I didn't look at it like, oh, he's this insensitive person. And it's like, no, he's just weird. And that's him, <laughs> he means well. You know, I, um, I guess I, I was fortunate enough to have a pretty healthy attitude about, about it, but I, I had good friends too. Nothing to, to, you know, I, I grew up a little bit fast, probably, but that was about it. Well, I think you've, you've sort of touched on some key points here, Karen, because, uh, you know, would you rather have all the material goods growing up and no love and no support or have nothing and have the love and support? And I know what I'd rather have uh, yeah. because that, that the latter has, has served me well. And the thing with regards to parents, the thing that I came to learn not that long ago, really, and I'm just recently turned 40, is that the, my parents did the best they could with the tools they had available, right? And even though at the time it seemed like that they were deliberately trying to undermine certain things, it, I don't believe anyone's inherently bad in that regard. And when I sort of came to forgave or forgive both parents for any wrongdoing, whatever you want to call it, um, it really helped set that, that relationship up much better and, and help set me free, I think. Yeah. So you, your attitude's really great. And, you know, your mum, so she, is she no longer with us? She passed away last year. I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah. She was at the book, actually, How High the Moon is, it very much came out of her, it's based on her childhood. And so she was helping me telling, you know, answering questions about what her childhood was like. She grew up in the 1940s in a little town outside of Charleston. But the beauty is um, she was in her hospital bed, shaking the book at everyone. She saw it all the way through. She got to have her, her copy and uh, the book came out last March and she passed away in April. So she, had, she was able to see it all the way through, which was a great blessing, really fortunate. 
Wow, yeah. And apart from your mum, who else in your life has been a major positive influence on your career and your life in general? Uh Oh my gosh, I always, I and mean, she's the person, my go-to person when anyone asks me, I always say her because it's true. Um, she has so much to do with that. Um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have some great, some wonderful teachers along the way. Um, there are people who don't know how much they've meant to me. Um, Would you ever tell them? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, my teacher in the sixth grade, Mrs. Sipperly, um, or yeah, Mrs. Sipperly, and then she became Mrs. Bone, that's her name now, Mrs. Bone, was the um, the most amazing woman. I mean, she was this, she was like, she made us sing in class all the time. She had a piano in the, there, and she was part of a barbershop quartet with her husband, and so she was the, <laughs> big handsome woman with a big smile and always laughing and always encouraging and she would um she she gave us all nicknames so that had to do with how we something about us our personalities or our parents and so we all had our own personal nicknames and she had cubby holes for us and in those things she'd return papers and stuff or you'd give papers to her in your cubby but sometimes you'd get a special note that said you know that she just like a thumbs up kind of thing like she noticed how you handled something and she'd write about it. or she'd say i see this is going on and i don't want you to start you know just because the such and such is doing this don't you go ahead and you know she was she was she saw you she was paying attention to you and um and she taught us a lot of things too that people weren't necessarily doing her approach was really great but so much of it was that she saw you this is a teacher who she had all this energy and support. Um, and I just was so fortunate to have her in my life. Uh, you know, I have a friend who was in the class as well. And I mean, she, I have a lot of friends who I think she changed all of our lives. I mean, I, it was a, I have a friend who is, who's in the class. He's um, black. And it, you know, so he was my other black person in class. I think we were two of three of us in that class actually. And uh, he's black and he's gay, and he is now. And he had a hard time coming up in school. That he sang, and I would watch him all through school singing opera in front of, you know, the 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 whole school. And it was difficult to be a black gay, you know, young man singing opera in the eighties. <laughs> You know, it was like in school, like that's just like the hardest thing to do. <laughs> and he kept in contact with her and with her support. Don't you know he lives in Germany and that's what he does for a living. He's been doing it for years. He's an opera singer, successful opera singer. And Fantastic. Like, was great. It's just like, it, I just, and I know so much of it had to do with having a person like that in your life early on that is saying, I see you and you're incredible and you're fine. Just as you are, you know, let's keep, let's keep you being you. And, um, and I felt that kind of support from her too. That's all, she's always stayed with me that way. So she's definitely someone. Well, I would strongly encourage you to, for anyone that, that is, um, that you'd like to pass that information on, cause I'll tell you a great story, Karen. In writing my book, it's all about my life. And there was a chapter in there when I was six years old, when I was at school, when a teacher asked me what I was doing, and it was my birthday and we had no money at all. And mum had said to me that she'll make it up to me. And, and I, as a six-year-old, just blurted out. My mum said, we don't have any money. And she ended up running at the end of school and gave me an envelope that she told me to take straight home and give to my mum that had $30 in it, which was about 10% of the net teacher's wage back in 1986. And... I, she was a, she was a part-time teacher at the time and I forgot her name. So I called up the school and they launched this manhunt trying to find out which teacher it was. They thought it was one particular teacher that had since passed away. And then they worked out that it was this Miss Mandy. And I was fortunate enough to be able to speak to her on the phone about three weeks ago. I read her the chapter of the book. It was an incredibly humble moment in my life. And she was blown away. And so I'm going to go back to the school when we things open up again and deliver a keynote and read the thing. And she's going to be invited to the assembly. So cool. 
Yeah. So do it. Do it if you can. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's crazy. I wrote. I was. I was shooting a, a mini series years ago, and I wrote her a letter, and I tucked it away, and I came upon it recently. I never sent it. I never knew where to send it, and um, and so I'm gonna send it to her. I'm gonna send her a new up to date letter, and then I'll send her that letter from like ninety ninety six or something. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I and I'm glad you just kind of said that because uh, that that does mean a lot. It's like, what's the what's the use in holding it? I need to give that to her, share that with her. Well, Miss Miss Mandy has turned into a priest. She's a canon, grand canon, or whatever you call it in, in New Zealand, wow. and, and uh, she's gone through some tough times. And uh, yeah, so she was she was stoked. Um, <laughs> yeah, what a wonder! I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. So um, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Uh, Karen, it would be remiss of me not to ask you about some of the major positive influences from your time on the show. Yeah. I know you are very close to to James Avery. What? Yeah. Who are the? Who are the? Um, what other individuals did you meet on the show? Whether they were guests or on the show that had a, a profound impact on your life? Well, before you run away from James too fast, I have to say, um, I mean that that man had a tremendous impact on me. Uh, and I, I, it took me a while to realize how much Sweet Blackberry and the mission of Sweet Blackberry and bringing these little known stories of African-American achievement to kids came from James. Because James used to share stories all the time and talk about things all the time. Have you heard about this? Did you know about this? He always had this and he loved Sweet Blackberry. I mean, he was able to, to see what I was doing before he passed, but I didn't even realize how much that went in and really, he has everything to do with that, um, with, with Sweet Blackberry. So James, I, I have to say, and, and just as a person, as an individual, I was, we were all very lucky to have him, to have him in our lives and to be so close to him. Um, uh, other people on the show that came about, I mean, the whole, for me, playing family, I grew up, as I said, as an only child and, um, to be able to have siblings <laughs> was awesome. <laughs> you know, Alfonso and I quick, quickly became brother and sister and Ta is still like my little sister and Alf's still like my brother. And Will was like a cousin, like having this cousin. And um, it, I didn't have those relationships like that. And so that was, you know, we've kind of were all playing house for six years and we were having a blast doing it. So, and it was, such a um there, there was such an impact from this whole moment in our lives that we, we definitely bonded we were all going through something that would change our lives forever um as far as guests you know people came and they left quickly but boy did we meet a lot of people well oprah uh, was on there oprah was on um tom jones was on <laughs> um josh Gabor, milton burrell so many sports stars, Belle Biv DeVoe, you know, we just had, and I, I loved um, Brian Stokes Mitchell, who played Trevor, my fiance. Um, he was so great to work with. It was really, it was, it was sad and funny, but you know, when he passed away, you know, bungee jump proposal episode, but cause it was funny, but it was, it meant Brian wasn't going to be back on the show, which was kind of <laughs> devastating when we read it for the first time. Um, but it was, uh, it was a really, it was a great experience. We were very lucky. The whole experience, I, there was, you know, between the cast and the crew, I'm still in touch with so many people. And, um, cause we had a really, we had something really special going on that doesn't happen all the time. And, um, and I'm, you know, as much as I get frustrated with Facebook, I'm also grateful for Facebook because a lot of us have been able to kind of keep a, you know, tabs on each other a little. Like, even if we don't talk regularly, I know where to find, you know, some people. And, um, and I get to see how they are, what they're up to, and what goes on with everyone. Because uh, Tatiana Ali is involved on the, in the board, on the board yes. for your Sweet Blackberry, is that right? Yes, she is. Yeah, she's a, a brilliant young lady, Harvard grad. She's just like an amazing woman. Now she's a mama of two as well. Well, and and you are as well. And I and I heard something a while back um, that someone said, "What makes you smile?" And you said, "Your kids make you smile." 
Why yeah. is that? Why is that? Why? Because they're amazing. I just, I do all the time too. They'll just be talking about having some big conversation. My son gets frustrated with me because he's like, mom, <laughs> sometimes I'll just like glaze over. <laughs> I'm just kind of. Oh, is it God. because you see yourself in them? No. No. Will you see other not. family members in them? No. It's not that kind of recognition. It's, um, I'm so, I'm in awe of the fact that this person is, I'm watching them since, you know, since they first arrived. I've been watching them grow and become and I'm so proud of them and I'm so amazed by them. I'm amazed all the time because they are completely their own thing. Like their personalities are so different and they always have been. You know, there's only so much that we we do, but they there are certain things about my son that he has been showing since he could speak or since he could communicate. There are aspects of his personality that are so strong and so Nico, like that's him, you know, and and even as he gets older, they, you know, it moves, it evolves and changes with a growing boy. But that's like, that's still him. Like he's still a truth teller. Like he's still, you know, he'll still confront you if something's wrong. You know, he's just got this, there are certain things about him. And, um, and I love to wait, watch the way their minds work. My daughter is brilliant and we'll have, you know, in-depth conversations about things and I just find myself going, oh my gosh, I'm talking to somebody who's like almost like a peer. Like she's so <laughs> right. The stuff she's saying to me, I'm like, oh my God. And I find myself wanting to share articles with her all the time that I know she'll understand and she'll get and she'll have something to say about it and she'll want to chew it up and you know talk more. And I am it's just exciting to watch them be become and um and it's not about me or my husband or other family members. It's about them just watching these, these plants just grow and they become so beautiful. You know, I just, they make me smile for sure. Well, they certainly do. I'm going to ask you one last question before we wrap this up, Karen. What do you want to be remembered for long after you've left this planet? What do I want to be remembered for? Um, I hope that it's such a funny thing. I mean, I'm not really, I don't think that much about that, about how people remember me. I hope that I could, I would affect people's kindness toward themselves and others. You know, if anything, just maybe I was kind and it, and it helps them uh, see that in themselves, recognize that in themselves, be that for themselves and others. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to, I don't, they don't need to be thinking about me. <laughs> you know. Well, I, I, I get the sense that you are incredibly kind individual in it. And, you know, you've, you've written a book, which is, it's, it's a legacy. And maybe, maybe there is an autobiography in there somewhere that needs to be written because I think we should never underestimate the power of our own stories, Karen. And, and you know, you, you've lived an extraordinary life, you know, no more extraordinary than, you know, your average person on the street, but, right. um, you know, not, not diminishing any of the, the wonderful work that you've done, but I think people would have a genuine interest in, in learning more about this. So my encouragement to you, you've, you've gotten a couple already under your belt. Maybe, maybe use this time to, to get something on paper. And I think I found it really cathartic from my own end. And maybe, maybe you will too. Maybe, maybe. Thank you for, thank you for that advice. I think it's, it's something to definitely gnaw on. <laughs> well, Karen, I'd love to thank you so much for your contribution today and i and i hope the the listeners get as much out of this as i have it's been a wonderful insight i didn't want to focus hardcore on any of the traditional stuff i wanted to get a chance to see the real uh karen parson and and um thank you again for your time sure thank you very much for having me it's been a pleasure